cardioversion and AFib versus rate control. My personal bias is if, of course, if they're unstable, Edison medicine is what you need. Um, you, you shock them out of it, and that's probably what you need to do um, because drugs often have at least some hypotensive effect that we use for this. And so if they're unstable, if it crosses your mind too much, um, go ahead, cardiovert. I, my personal bias is with um, Atomidate to put them down most of the time and, uh, and then shock them. Uh, if, they, if you've got time, they're relatively stable. Um, I tend to go more towards rate control. Um, I know that other places, Europe, Canada, they often like to actually cardiovert people out. Um, I think that it's a little bit risky, especially if you're not sure when it started. Because um, remember, if, unless it's within about 48 to 72 hours or so, you have the risk of causing ischemic complications if there's a clot in the heart. Um, I'm not confident enough with my echo skills, and it's debatable in the literature whether you're good enough, anyone's good enough with echo skills to make sure that there's not at least uh, some thrombus in the acute setting. Um, it's, it's a complex issue. But I like to rate control, and what I'm almost always using is DILT. Unstable? All right, so in the unstable patient, I think you really have two types of patients. You have the patient who is unstable purely because of their dysrhythmia, all right? And then you have the patient who has an un another underlying condition that's getting their heart upset, and then they have a dysrhythmia, right? So that poorly septic patient who, as a result, has uh, atrial fibrillation with RBR or whatever the dysrhythmia may be. If they're unstable and you want to attempt to cardiovert, I think that's fine. Run with it. Go for it. Uh, I, if possible, would like to try to load them with a little heparin. If it's just AFib with RVR, I load them with a little bit of heparin. Just to, you know, I, I, that's what the recommendations are. Is it going to prevent some catastrophic event? Mm, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't think that evidence is out there. But most people would recommend that you do that if you look uh, and most uh, leading authorities on that. However, I say all that to say that if the primary problem is not the dysrhythmia, i.e. they're septic or something else, don't be surprised when they don't cardiovert because they're probably not because whatever it is that's underlying that is irritating the myocardium is still there. All right, and it's still, they're probably going to pop right back into AFib if they cardiovert at all. So um, give it a whirl, but be prepared to move on to something else, whether it's uh, vasopressors or fluid boluses and uh, just good old-fashioned rate control. Now, when to rate control, uh, if they're under 150, I, don't, I wouldn't struggle with that too much. I try to resuscitate them, all right? Try to resuscitate them first. If they're over 150, I start thinking about rate control a little bit more aggressively because they don't have enough diastolic filling time to maintain their cardiac output, and you need to prolong that diastolic filling time. So I'd be a little more aggressive in that scenario, but if they're, say, 130 and I think they're septic, treat the sepsis first. Um, and you, you may see them uh, either spontaneously cardiovert uh, or slow down on their own once that adrenergic surge is uh, relieved. Um, if you get them adequately resuscitated, so 130, then add on some uh, rate controls, maybe nodal blockers. And you'll probably have seen the patient that you shock them, they get into like sinus for a few seconds and they go right back into it. As Rich points out, really you should be doing these things in parallel. So while you're getting all that stuff ready, you know, are you getting your heparin going? Are you getting fluids? Are you doing the other things that might fix the underlying problem that pushed them over to begin with? Otherwise, you shock them. They'll, they'll last for a few seconds. They'll go right back into it, and you just can't keep shocking them over and over again. What do you guys use for your electricity break? Uh, so what's the cardioversion dose? Yeah. They, um, the, like, do you use, the, like, do any of you guys use a higher dose so that you're not Well, with AFib, you usually start high. I personally start at 200. Well, a lot of people tell you start, um, actually, my, what, the way I was taught was lower, uh, 50. Um, I usually start around 100, 150. And I do the AP placement because that's going to shoot across the atria. Remember, your ventricle is out more lateral. Your atria is more centrally located. So um, you're actually directing your energy across the atria if you do an AP placement. So uh, that's usually how I do it. And I start at 100. I have no problem ramping it up. Um, but usually 100 is enough. Um, but again, my experience has been if they have a primary problem, they don't actually cardiovert, and I usually run it up to 100, 250, and they still don't cardiovert, and then I just say enough of this. Let's uh, do something else. And the stable patient who has uh, new onset um, and no pre-existing structural heart disease, I have no problem cardioverting them. If they come in, they're a good, reliable historian. I give them a the heparin bolus, do an AP placement, 50 joules I've cardioverted with, 100 joules. I don't think I've ever gone over 100 in that stable new onset 
uh, patient. And I like the cardiovertum because the quicker you get them out, the more likely they're going to stay out. Uh, well, yeah, you have to you have to weigh the risk of anticoagulating them, but yeah, you, you generally will anticoagulate them. I think some of the newer novel oral ones, such as Rivaroxaban or Xarelto, for those that have sold out, uh, are actually pretty compelling for this. Um, it seems very reasonable. Um, I think another common thing that's forgotten is you need to do a little bit of a deeper dive on electrolytes for all that we make fun of, of folks for like every day checking in mag and calcium and whatnot. Uh, magnesium and calcium are excellent um, adjuncts to help supplement these other things that you're doing on any AFib patient. So don't forget that you need to not just get your BMP and call it a day. You probably would need to know a magnesium level and a calcium level in these folks. And if they're truly unstable, uh, calcium is a little bit of a, of a poor man's um, ionotrope. So it's going to get you very little harm by giving them calcium empirically in someone that doesn't have renal failure. Magnesium may drop their blood pressure a little bit, but not by much. So if you're really struggling and you're flailing about, consider giving them a little bit of mag, a little bit of calcium. Be a little slow with the mag bolus. You don't want to slam it in there or else it can cause hypotension.